We're particularly excited um, for Mariana and Mia to be joining us today because the work they champion is highly aligned with the RSA's own design for life vision for a world that is more resilient, more balanced, and regenerative. At the RSA, we bring people and ideas and collective action to unlock opportunities for people, places, and planet to flourish in harmony. We know we are experiencing an era of public crises, economic, social, and environmental, rendering our world fragile, unbalanced, and regenerative. The only viable way forward is to totally reimagine and redesign how our economic, social, and environmental systems work together to benefit each other, to replenish each other in nested and reciprocal ways. This will require a green revolution um, that is facilitated by our, by our own states, um, governments, governments, and how we finance initiatives and change. And this will be at the heart of today's discussion. If you want to find out more about the RSA's Design for Life mission and how we can get involved in the thriving global fellowship community of which many, many of you are a part of, please visit uh, the rsa.org. It is now time to hand over to your chair for the evening, Thank you very much indeed, Joanna. And, uh, and thank you to the RSA for hosting this great event. My name's Justin Rowlett. I'm the climate editor of the BBC, and I will be chairing the event this evening. And it is my great pleasure to um, uh, host this event tonight with the Honourable Mia Amor Motley and Professor Mariana Matsukato. As you can see, we're lucky enough to have Professor Matsukato mm. here in the flash <laughs> with us. Ms. Motley uh, couldn't make it in person and will be joining us by video link in a moment. So first of all, welcome to you both and welcome to the audience here at the Royal Society of the Arts in London and of course to everybody who's joining us remotely. Thank you all for coming. Now, Mariana will be speaking first tonight and I'm sure many of you are already familiar with her work. She's the Professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London and is the founding director of UCL's Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Mariana has won a host of international prizes and accolades and is the author of four highly acclaimed books. The mm -hmm. most recent, The Big Con, How the Consulting Industry Weakens Our Businesses, Infantilizes Our Governments and Warps Our Economy, will be influencing our conversation today, as you will discover. And fear not, if you haven't already bought a copy of this book, <laughs> they are available to purchase at the end of the event. And if you're quick, you might even get Mariana <laughs> to sign it for you. Mariana, will you please... So we're going to have... Mariana's going to speak first, then we're going to hear from Mia. Mariana, would you please... Uh, sure. Take to the lectern. Thank you, Justin. Um, so thanks, everyone. <laughs> thanks, everybody, for coming. I assume we'll see Mia when she's ready. Is that how it's going to work? Yes? Cool. So first, I just want to honor my co-author, Rosie Collington here, who's my uh, PhD student, an absolutely brilliant PhD student at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Stand up. <laughs> Um, this is actually the first event for the book, but it's a weird event. We're all a bit like, well, what is this event? Actually, because it's more of a love fest with uh, the <laughs> Prime Minister of Barbados. It happens to be the week of the book launch. The book is coming out on Thursday. There's different events. There's also one, a proper event with Rosie and I in terms of for the book. Um, at the How To Academy, we have an event at um, LSE, so on and so forth. But tonight, it's much more about the doing, like why this book actually matters to the need to actually act. And Mia Motley, I believe, is a once-in-a-lifetime leader who is calling out for all global leaders to lead. Um, in fact, at COP26, she said, when will leaders lead? And at COP27, we actually organized an event with her through the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL with herself, with Nicola Sturgeon, uh, with Ngozi Okonjo-Wheeler, the head of the World Trade Organization, and um, the Minister of Planning in Egypt. And it was very much based on uh, Mia's call for action. And what the book is about is that it's not a coincidence that we're so slow. You know, uh, Mia, uh, not Mia, so, um, Greta Thornburg, she keeps saying, stop, blah, blah, blah. She's like, 
you know, everyone's talking about the sustainable development goals, everyone's talking about climate change, we even talk about COVID and how we have to become more prepared, and yet, and yet there's no action. And Greta Thornburg, even when she was 16, she's now 18 or 19, she's 19. growing, uh, like the rest of us are as well, unfortunately. Uh, she said, when your house is on fire, what do you do? Do you sit there and debate? Should I stay? Should I go? You get out and you get out quickly. And if you read the IPCC report on climate change, we are not getting out of this mess quickly. So what the book talks about, but also really what the Institute talks about, and uh, Rosie here is a PhD student at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, is that we've actually designed ourselves into this inertia. It's not a coincidence. It's not like, oh, whoops, we forgot to act. If you think about the role of government as at best fixing market failures, you are by definition always in fixing mode. You are by design always in reactive mode. You are by design in insecurity mode, right? If someone else is creating value and you at best start redistributing value, enabling someone else to create value, de-risking who? The cool risk takers, Elon Musk, the Steve Jobs, and so on, you have no confidence. Your tools will at best be designed in terms of enabling, de-risking, fixing, regulating, redistributing. And by the way, we don't have enough of that. We don't have enough redistribution. You know, progressive as opposed to regressive taxation is a good thing. But if that's what you're doing at best, there's nothing to redistribute. There's no wealth to redistribute. Because you're sitting there on the sidelines cheering someone else on who actually, if we look globally at business investment, hasn't actually been taking so much risk, hasn't necessarily been reinvesting profits back into the economy. And if you look at the data, uh, just like of global GDP, and if you break down GDP into consumption, investment, kind of government spending, net exports, the I bit, so the business investment, side of things actually hasn't really been picking up. We have a lot of profit, so the profit share of global income is at a record high. The labor share, hence, is at a record low, and for that I recommend you all read again, as I'm sure you all have, Marx, Capital One, Two, and Three. Um, Marx actually talked a lot about this. So did David Ricardo, so did Ad Adam Smith. Adam Smith is one of the most ununderstood economists in history. He went down as the free marketeer. Actually, he was all about freeing the market from rent and rent extraction. And this lack of investment, business investment, getting reinvested back into the economy is actually due to a lot of rent seeking. So if you, for example, are a company like Pfizer, and I keep telling my husband if I don't come home at night, it's Pfizer. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Um, and spend a huge amount of your profits on just buying back your own shares to boost stock, pro uh, stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. That's a problem. And globally, we've had over $6 trillion having been used for share buybacks in the last 10 years. So this is one of the big kind of structural issues in modern day capitalism. How do we get the profits that are being generated in our capitalist system reinvested back into the economy? Now to do that, you need really smart policy as well. You need policy not just about regulating, but also, for example, really smart policy in terms of fostering, inspiring expectations about where future opportunities lie. If you speak to a lot of the Pfizer's and Exxon's, those two are the biggest share buybackers in the world, at least up until recently they were, why they're doing all these share buybacks, they often say there's no opportunities to invest. And if you look at both of those sectors, health and energy, there's huge opportunities to invest, but let's just pretend that's true. Let's just pretend there's no opportunities to invest and actually doing the share buybacks is the right thing. Then all of a sudden, the policy answer should be, we should be investing in the really cool things that are about the future, about future opportunities in health, around the digital divide, around climate, around the blue economy, and I'm gonna to get to Mia Motley's incredibly inspirational thinking about the blue economy in a second, then that in theory is also about direct investment. It's not just about indirect investment, about uh, kind of facilitating and making things easier, being business friendly, right? 
So how do we actually think about policy and policy making and the role of the state as being at the center of a process of co-creating value, of shaping markets, co-shaping, co-creating markets, as opposed to just fixing markets? So again, the institute that we've set up, uh, which is only about five years old, we're going to have our fifth anniversary soon, is all about that, kind of that new economic thinking that we need about rethinking the role of the state, not just as a facilitator, redistributor, and so on. And what the book does, the big con, is saying that actually then the fact that many consulting companies, and we really focus on the consulting industry, not just a consultant, like an individual, the consulting industry, the names, the McKinsey's, the KPMG's, the Deloitte's, the PWC's, have so much power in our economy is that by design, we have actually created this insecurity within governments that they actually don't know how to do. And that they require that consultant to come in to, cre to you know, kind of provide the expertise, provide the advice that's actually then going to legitimize perhaps what the government already wanted to do and even had internal experts to do. But because there's this strong narrative that governments actually don't know how to row, don't know how to steer, don't know how to really create value, but at best can redistribute, regulate, administer, de-risk, enable, all these really boring words that make you want to fall asleep, then they require this presence of the, I'll just pick on McKinsey for a minute, the McKinsey's. But interestingly, we even see it in business. So a lot of uncomfortable business decisions, whether it's the downsizing, uh, whether it's the share buyback trend that I just talked about, sometimes just having it rubber stamped by the McKinsey's and the Deloitte's of the world helps. So this kind of laziness, this inertia, some ways this, um, I, I was going to say a rude word so I won't say it, but anyway, inertia and laziness within both public and private is what we're calling out. It's like, take ownership of your decision. <laughs> Don't require that kind of rubber stamp. But in the case of government, it's much worse. So we actually cite Lord Agnew, uh, who is a Tory conservative lord in the UK government, who during COVID said, what is going on? He started looking at the numbers of how much the UK government had been spending on consultants um, uh, of, of the Deloitte kind. You, you might remember Deloitte was charged to uh, uh, do the test and trace system you know, during COVID with zero expertise uh, in that area. And he started looking at how much money the UK government had spent on consultants in Brexit and COVID and said, this is nuts. We are infantilizing, infantilizing, it's a very strong word, Whitehall. Hence, we actually you know, put it on the title, infantilizing government. And, and this is what we call out. You will never know how to ride a bicycle if you don't fall off, right? So learning by doing, trial and error and error and error. So the more we think about and even frame and theorize the role of government as just all this boring stuff I already talked about, the more we make it incapable, the more this addiction to others helping you in theory, whether it's the rubber stamping where they're actually not necessarily helping you, but you need the rubber stamp or actually helping you because you've lost that capacity. You've stopped investing in your capabilities. Uh, Reiner Cattell, uh, my uh, deputy director, has just written a wonderful book about the need for bureaucracy with innovation and creative bureaucracies. Right, so the learning by doing that anyone, whether it's a kid, whether it's a private firm, whether it's a government entity, needs to actually try and do stuff. If all the doing is, being, is happening elsewhere, you'll stop learning and you'll become kind of stupid and you'll become a bit lazy and you'll become a bit fragile and not agile and not flexible. So we all want you know, flexible and agile government. We might not have that. We have you know, sometimes very vertical bureaucracies, slow bureaucracies, but there's no reason that the word bureaucratic should be a negative word. We've made it a negative word. We could have sexy, edgy, creative bureaucracies. And we need that in the public sector. We need that in the private sector. We need that in the civil society in order to tackle the biggest challenges of our time around climate, health, and the digital divide. No one actor, definitely not the state, definitely not the private sector, and definitely not philanthropy, and other organizations are going to do this on their own. So what the book is calling for 
is an action, and it's, it's a warning call, but also a call for action on really investing within our capabilities and capacities to tackle these difficult challenges. And I have been, I'm gonna hand over to Mia in a second, if, if she's, is she online or should I tell some jokes? Yeah, is she? Yeah. She is? Good. Where? Where is she? <laughs> okay. The reason I am so honored to um, be in the room virtually with the Prime Minister Bar Barbados, but also having just spent a whole week there a couple weeks ago working with her government and welcome Minister Corey Lane here, who um, we're also going to spend a day with tomorrow. Please stand up. Um, who is doing incredibly important work in uh, Barbados, looking at really how we can also tackle crime, not just from policing, not just from the crime side, but from the social and economic determinants of that problem. Um, but the reason I am so interested in the Prime Minister of Barbados' work is that she has been globally the person that is calling for change in terms of the global financial architecture. We need fiscal space. I often imitate her. She goes like this. She goes, meet me, fiscal space. <laughs> Get me out of <laughs> um, We need the fiscal space. We need completely different conditions around our globe. Andy, you are here. I was told you were leaving. <laughs> Welcome, Andy, who's the head of the RSA. Um, <laughs> so she is calling for a change in global financial architecture, right? Because we have had the wrong conditionalities attached to global finance, which has reduced that fiscal space, but she's also really calling on the direct finance that's required. If you think of all the different types of finance that we have globally in development finance institutions like state banks and development uh, bank institutions to actually be directly, as I was saying before, financing the solutions to the problems we have. But also, she has talked about the double jeopardy that the so-called global south has been really uh, penalized by the way that the so-called, these are very problematic words to be honest, I think, but anyway, the way that the global north has developed in terms of having to bear the consequences of a very unstable form of development. So bearing the consequences in terms of the droughts, the floods, the hurricanes, and the other side of that double jeopardy is then having to face the consequences of this very dysfunctional global financial architecture. And I just want to repeat, I don't know, uh, Prime Minister Motley, if you were here when I said it, but you are a once-in-a-lifetime leader. I am honored to be in the room with you, uh, both virtually but also live, as we've been working together in Barbados. And I don't know, Justin, if you need to introduce her yeah, or so what. But she's incredibly relevant because without the financial space, the fiscal space doesn't work. Without the fiscal space and the capacity space, we will not be able to tackle our challenges. So thank you very much. Mariana, thank you for that rousing call for action. Oh, we've got an echo coming back from there, which is a bit distracting. Um, there's a lot there to explore. We'll be exploring more in detail. Sorry? OK. It's just it's quite hard to speak. Um, but first, we're going to hear from Prime Minister uh, Mia Motley. Um, I was going to say a few words of introduction. We had a really, I don't know if you heard that, Mia. We had a superb. Not hearing anybody. Prime Minister of Barbados and the first woman to hold the office. She was elected in 2018, winning by the largest margin in the history of the country. Prime Minister Motley has been active in the political life of Barbados for almost three decades and has held, um, other, among other esteemed positions she's held, she served as the co-chair of the Development Committee of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund from November 2020 to October 21. Welcome, Mia. Please take the floor. I hope you heard that. Thank you very much. And, and, and let me say thank you to Mariana, um, who truly is a force of nature and who has been prepared to speak truth to power all over. Um, 
I, I, I feel always awkward in this technological innovation called green rooms because it is a case of speaking and not seeing. And I learned just now that you couldn't see me, Mariana, even though I've been here before we started. So please note that I heard every word and thank you for your <laughs> uh, very kind comments. It, 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 it is a wrong thing to be invisible in a room. But now you perhaps know how we feel as small island states because since our independence, regrettably, our absence of capacity to influence institutions that impact us every day has been a grave and great problem. And why? Because most people in management positions will look for a one-size-fits-all prescription because it's easy for them. But it doesn't mean it works for those of us who have completely different conditions. And a small island developing state cannot face the same world as a large country like Brazil, um, a large country like Turkey, and a large developing country like, 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 like Ghana or, 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 or Nigeria. So we have to start first by recognizing that we have to be appropriate to risk and appropriate to condition. We have to be fit for purpose. But for us to be fit for purpose, and in order for us to deal with the topic that you have here, state capacity and green revolution, it does mean that we need to break it down. One, local capacity will always be an issue because of population size in smaller countries. In larger countries, they will have greater capacity to be able to access the skills, provided, of course, they have a legacy and a condition of strong education and strong um, human resource development. Regrettably, the process of colonization robbed us of that opportunity, and we're trying to play catch up on that. With respect to access to finance and access to a just investment strategy and technology, then we depend on the outside world. And in depending on the outside world, the outside world has said, oh, if you've done well and you have increased your GDP per capita and you've increased your, your general level of development, we will put you in a box that has a ceiling. Women kind of know it well because it's called a glass ceiling. And that ceiling prevents us and precludes us from being able to continue to access concessional funding, recognizing that if we are to finish achieving the sustainable development goals, as it is fashionable to call them, but as we have said, our simple wishes for development of our people, we are constrained because not only is the journey huge because of how far from below normal we are coming at independence, but it is also huge because the world keeps throwing at us conditions that we have then to divert expenditure to be able to address. The moment in which we find ourselves with the poly crisis is a perfect example because you have the climate crisis, the pandemic, inflation, supply disruption, but let me carry you back, if you may, to 1993-94 with the WTO, when we said that we needed special and differential treatment because our percentage share of global trade in goods is 0.000%. Our percentage share in global trade in services is 0.0001%. And therefore, we had no capacity to distort global trade in goods services. As a result, we asked for special and differential treatment in order to be able to protect our manufacturing and our agricultural sectors primarily. We didn't get it. 30 years on, our agricultural sector has declined by 22% and our manufacturing sector by a third. Now, if that does not, and, and I can stop talking about the numbers and Corey can tell you as he's there, that when we were growing up, we used to have a lot of industry on the Harbor Road, women making clothes, doing all kinds of things, electrical um, components, etc. All of those industries have gone from our environment, largely because of a failure of the global community 
to recognize that the capacity to distort was simply not there. But it gets worse because the number of farmers producing local food has also decreased. And at the very time that the climate crisis is placing pressure on us to be able to have greater levels of food security and the pandemic, by the way, we have less capacity because people are not going to grow for two, three months of the year when you have a storm. And indeed, the food won't grow in time. People need to grow year round in order to ensure that the country has food security. But if your markets have now flooded you because you no longer have the non-tariff barriers and the licensing and the quotas to protect your domestic production, then your farmers are up against countries who are still subsidizing their agriculture, by the way, and who also have larger benefits as a result of development and being there at the formation of these institutions beforehand. So that's why I say that the conditions of access to finance from the World Bank, World Bank was intended to stop poor people from being poor and to stop poor countries from being poor. That is what the elimination of poverty means. Stop poor countries, stop poor people. Problem is, is that 70% of poor people live in middle-income countries. So if you deny middle-income countries the opportunity from accessing concessional funding, especially to fight conditions that are global in nature, that are necessary to be fought if we are going to create a global commons that is encouraging development for all of us, then we are going to have problems there at the World Bank because it means that you risk these countries going back into poverty. You risk the pauperization of these countries. And that is why we simply said, we're not interested in playing the man. We're not interested in any of those things. We're interested in ensuring that the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development in the third decade of the 21st century is equal to the task in the same way that it was equal to the task in World War II, post-World War II, sorry, when the reconstruction that it was looking for was clearly the reconstruction of Europe, not of the colonies, and the development that it was looking for was clearly the development of, the, of those countries and not the colonies. Now, if these countries have now, if these colonies have now become countries, in the third decade of the 21st century, whose reconstruction are we looking for and whose development are we looking for? And the last part of what I want uh, uh, to discuss, and ironically, the IMF is beginning to get it because they understand that they must not only now treat the symptoms, but they have to treat the causes. And that's what the Resilience and Sustainability Trust does for us. Not perfectly, but better than anything else that has been put on the table. That, that Resilience and Sustainability Trust gives us access to long-term funding, 20-year funding, with a five-year moratorium and five and a half year moratorium and at cheap costs. There are other things that we would like to see, but it goes way beyond anything else that has been put on the table. The issue of debt sustainability, Mariana, you've heard me say it over and over, it's no sense giving us access to money and I can't spend it. And therefore the question of debt sustainability and fiscal space is equally important. I can lose weight at six pounds a month, four pounds a month, three pounds a month, two pounds a month. The important thing is the downward trajectory of the debt rather than just believing that you can lose it so fast that the body loses condition and capacity to do day-to-day -day functions. And that is what we are against. We're not saying that you don't pay down debt. Of course you have to pay down debt and it has to be sustainable. But the rate at which you do it, especially in a polycrisis, in the same way that we accept that there was a need for counter-cyclical fiscal measures in certain circumstances, I'm saying to you that debt sustainability has to be addressed, especially if we accept that to fight the climate crisis, that we need to build more to be able to adapt and to be resilient because $1 spent ahead of time saves $7 after the fact of a climate crisis hitting us. The last thing I want to address, Mariana, is, is your baby, and that is the mission economy. We knew instinctively, and when we came to office in May 2018, the first meeting that we had after the cabinet was sworn in was with the social partnership. Barbara, this is very lucky to have a social partnership that we've had now for just over 30 years with the, um, with the unions, the labor movement, and the private sector, and the government. And it allows us to address the big issues 
of the country. It allows us to set common missions and to treat to those missions not as a governmental mission, but as a national mission. And therefore, the first thing that we inherited was a government that had four weeks of import cover, and that was the second most indebted country in the world in terms of GDP per capita. With the adversary, with the, with the, with the monies owed to people, we effectively were at 177% debt to GDP. We made, and we had four weeks of import cover with a debt payment due within two weeks of being elected, which would have brought us down to two and a half weeks of import cover. And we called a meeting of the social partnership, and I asked a very simple question, one by one by one in the room. Who in here wants to save the Barbados dollar? Who in here wants to save the exchange rate? Because for those who don't know, the exchange rate in this country is like the holy grail, believe you me. And Barbadians are prepared to accept certain things as a consequence because it gives them the stability of a fixed exchange rate rather than the fluctuation that comes and, and the difficult circumstances that comes with a fluctuating currency, a floating currency. Whether you like it or not, that's the country's decision. In the same way that the provision of free tertiary education is something that all of us agree to pay for, even those of us who have no children, because we believe that every child born in this country has the right to be educated at the ter up to tertiary level um, and, and, and to be able to be there for in a position to lift themselves out of poverty and to carry their families thereafter. When we ask that question, 90% of the answers, first of all, everybody said that they wanted to save the dollar. Then we asked, how do you believe that we can do it? And we asked everybody to give top three to five suggestions. When we did that, the majority of the room, 90% of the room actually agreed on the measures. And that made the execution of the mission more successful um, and capable of being delivered in a shorter period of time. One of the great tragedies for us is that we actually finished our debt restructuring and a lot of our structural adjustment, which was a homegrown program. Um, I would say 70% of the structural adjustment and 100% of the debt restructuring by December 2019. We don't even know where we would be had that not happened before the COVID pandemic hit us. I give this as an example to show what is possible when we set a common mission. And I can give you further examples during the course of the discussion today when the question and answer of where we think we can be and what we think we can do together. But unless you mobilize the resources of a country behind you, you're not going to get everybody. But if we can get 65 to 70% of the country moving in the same direction, transformation is possible. In our case, back in those early days of 2018, we set a mission critical agenda for the first 100 days to stop the bleeding, to stabilize the country. Our mission now must be to transform the nation and to transform the nation against the global challenges of one, the pandemic, two, the climate crisis. And it's not just this pandemic, but it's future pandemics, two, the climate crisis, three, food and water insecurity, four, the vexatious issue of digital access, which we acknowledge at least we can talk about digital access, but people in Africa, there's still 600 million people without access to electricity who can't even talk about digital access before they talk about access to electricity. So I genuinely believe that if we're going to look at the consequences of those problems, which can lead to high global insecurity and high global migration that we, and regional migration, that we need to be able to set ourselves these targets of one, how do we build capacity internally through training in situ? It doesn't make sense sending two or three people out. You've got to train the majority in place in the country, and you've got to do it over a period of time where new habits are developed. Two, a new capacity developed. Two, that we need to work to change the international financial institutions and the global institutions that set rules without seeing us and that therefore hobble us in our capacity to do the best that we can do with what we have. And three, that we need to set common missions in order to mobilize, to ensure, as we did with COVID, as we did with the exchange rate, that it is a national mission, binding together a people together, rather than believing that we can do this purely as a government or as different silos within the government. I'll pause at this stage because 
Um, I feel as though I'm talking to myself because I can't see or hear or feel any of you. Thank you. Mia, you've had us all wrapped here in London, so don't worry, we've all been paying full attention. Um, there's a huge kind of potential agenda between your two uh, addresses there. There's you know, an enormous amount we could cover. So I want to kind of begin by talking about the work that you two are doing together, because you're working together um, as part of uh, uh, Mia's green industrial strategy for Barbados. But I want to start, I mean, this is a little bit personal, but I'd like to start, I'd like to understand a little bit about your relationship. It's quite unusual. You working together. I want to know how you met and why you decided to have this collaboration. Mia, do you want to start or Mariana? Who wants to kick off? I let, I let, Mar I let Mariana start. <laughs> so how many of you have, have watched Mia's speeches, whether it's at COP26, the Summit of the Americas, and Los Angeles, COP27? So for me, and I have three daughters and a son, I have forced them, but I didn't have to force them, they were all as awestruck as I was, to watch Mia talk. Um, the Prime Minister of Barbados, I shouldn't say Mia. Anyway, I'm going to call her Mia because she's a friend. That's my but name. That's my name. She is <laughs> the most inspirational leader, I think, today. And it goes beyond politics. It's, it's poetry. It's, you, it's the pause. <laughs> it's the way of speaking. Of course, it's about the content you just heard. Uh, her speak. So for me, when I first heard her speak, um, I, I, I was, how do you say, so happy <laughs> because to be honest, I think we're all a bit depressed. <laughs> we are depressed in terms of that lack of action that I talked about. So for me, the first meeting was just hearing her speeches. And when I then went last July um, to what then became the Bridgetown Initiative kind of beginning seed meeting, uh, we got to speak. I was very honored. Mia, I don't know if, if you were saying, uh, I don't know if it was after how many drinks we had had or what, but you said, I had read your stuff and I've been wanting to bring you to Barbados for a long time. I was like, really? I never received a phone call or an email or anything. So I guess we had been in, you know, been hearing, reading or whatever each other. And then it just, um, we decided on the back of that meeting to then get in touch beyond the Bridgetown Initiative to talk about what would a, a green industrial strategy look like in Barbados, because Mia talked about a small island state. Barbados is also a large ocean state in terms of this massive ocean around it, the blue economy. What does it actually mean to bring all the different sectors in Barbados together around different types of missions? We have Tristan here, one of our MPA students. So currently, you know, that kind of love fest that we had before, currently what we're trying to do is work together on identifying different types of missions in Barbados, of which, again, Corey Lane here, a minister of, um, what's your exact title? It's so interesting. Minister of State, the Office of the Attorney General. But there's a crime part of it, too. Specific responsibility for crime prevention. Exactly. <laughs> so even something as specific as that in a country where crime is increasing in the same way that it is here in, in London, what does it mean actually to formulate a mission that puts value, culture, and identity at the center of a mission where we actually realize that so much inequality is due to the marginalization of people who don't feel valued, who are not valued. Um, and so anyway, the work we're currently doing is on that. Okay. Um, Mia, I mean, give us a, a little snapshot of, of your impressions when you first met Mariana. And, and you know, obviously you've drawn her into your kind of you know, circle and uh, she's advising you now. What, you know, what is your agenda? What do you hope to achieve? What is she bringing? that can hope you, one, hope, one imagines you hope will change Barbados? To begin with, um, Mariana is absolutely correct. We met last July formally, but I had been following her work. She did a lecture at the Caribbean Development Bank. She had published the books. And when we were last in government, one of the things that we kept making the point and to an audience that perhaps was not willing to listen, and um, when our um, past was former Prime Minister of Barbados and who as the deputy, would talk all the time about the entrepreneurial state. And that first piqued my interest with Mariana's book. But you know, you read things and put it down and you don't see. And then when she was given the CDB lecture, I realized that her work was on the economy and I went to read that book. 
And then when we were selling who we wanted to consult when we were putting together the Bridgetown Initiative, her name was one of the ones that came to the top of the list. And I am not an economist. I don't pretend to be. So when I realized that there were economists saying the same thing that I was saying as a leader and politically, it would be a natural alliance and a natural, I hope, friendship. And as fate would have it, when you meet somebody and it clicks, and philosophically, but also in terms of personality and attitude to life, there was a click in. So, Mariana, I describe as a force of nature because I think she's the only person whose sense of urgency exceeds mine. Now that's excellent. Well, tell us what your agenda is, because you've got this uh, this green industrial strategy for, Bar for Barbados. You're going to have to be quite brief. I mean, just give us an overview. I'm sure there's loads in there, but what what, what essentially are you seeking to achieve? Look, I'm seeking to transform my country. Um, small countries like us don't have a lot of capacity in terms of natural resources, etc. Although in the blue economy, we've discovered that we do. And that's why Mariano describes it as a big ocean state, which we willingly accept. But that takes time as well. Mm -hmm. And what has not happened, as I said, is that we've not been able to build on the decline in manufacturing and agriculture that has effectively been foisted on us by a change in global terms um, and conditions of trade through the WTO. Now, Europe still gets to subsidize agriculture. Why does not small states who are cut off from land and who have to depend on Miami for food? Imagine if Miami is hit tomorrow. All of the countries in the region are immediately affected by access to fresh food. So our simple strategy is one, to be able to become more self-sufficient in the things that make us resilient. Resilient against climate, coastal defenses are needed. We were spending money on coastal defenses 25 years ago before it was popular to talk. Mm -hmm. about a climate crisis. And as a result, our debt has increased, not as a result of um, other things that are bad, but because we have been literally trying to spend money to protect that coastal economy, which is what we have. Secondly, we want to continue to be able to educate our people freely, because without that, they can't become global citizens with Barbadian roots. Thirdly, we want to give our people access to health care just as you want to do in the UK. You're going through issues with the National Health Service now. In Barbados, we have a polyclinic system. We have a, a major hospital. When the pandemic hit, we had to build another hospital facility in order to not expose the majority of the population in the primary health care system, in the main health hospital we have from the worst aspects of the continued pandemic but that takes money we want to also ensure that our children have access to the best training in youth and culture because sportsmen and artists are global citizens and quite frankly artists determine whether performing or visual or whatever determine the possibilities of life and governments then shape the probabilities that exist so that you need our artists to lead the way philosophically and artistically as to what is possible for people from a small state in terms of small island state to the big ocean state. Bottom line, we need to be able to stave off the worst consequences of the global environment while leveraging the global re-globalization to create access to opportunities that may not naturally be available on 437 square kilometres. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, Prime Minister. Um, Mariana, I mean, for you, it must be really interesting. You've written a book. Mm -hmm. You've written a number of books. Mm -hmm. And now you have a Prime Minister to work with, in a way, to kind of, um, you know, to try and put some of your ideas into action. I mean, I've got a couple of questions around that. Like, has the collision with reality forced mm -hmm. you to rethink anything? But before that, a rather mischievous question, which is, mm -hmm. you know, you've written a book criticising the role of consultants. I mean, mm -hmm. essentially what you're doing in Barbados mm -hmm. is a consulting job. Yeah. And not just at the periphery, yeah, yeah, yeah. but at the heart of government. I mean, yeah. aren't you in danger of doing exactly what you criticise McKinsey and the others of doing? Sure. It's a great question, and it's, I don't want to say a silly one, but if you look <laughs> at the, 
the whole point of this institute is actually to strengthen government. So, to, so first of all, it's a department in a university. We should rediscover universities. <laughs> and academics globally have a lot of expertise. The point of the institute, and it's called Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, is to put public purpose at the center of policy design, but also to retrain the civil service. So literally the education, the curriculum that we currently have globally, whether it's in Barbados, whether it's in Brazil, whether it's in the UK, whether it's in Italy, comes from a theory of the state, which again is about market failure fixing, and it's been trickled down into new public management and public choice theory. I won't go into the details of that, but the point is there's a curriculum and education out there for global bureaucrats, which has convinced them that the best they can do is to fix. Um, the best they can do is to worry about not crowding out business. And there's the whole kind of theory and education around that. So our core purpose in the Institute is actually to rethink the training, to rethink the research and the theory that we need of the state as co-creating, not just fixing, and then working with policymakers. And I mean, uh, the, the Prime Minister and Barbados and her team are incredibly inspirational, but we've worked with many different governments globally. And to learn from that practice and bring it back to the theory. And the ultimate goal is that you don't need a second round <laughs> of work with them because they will then have actually, you know, uh, uh, become if in some ways a stronger uh, a state with stronger capacity, which has been dismantled by design, not by coincidence, that I talked about before. The Prime Minister uh, has talked about during COVID the need, for example, for outcomes-oriented procurement. Um, and collective and joint procurement between Caribbean countries uh, during COVID. We know that with war. You know, the US, for example, has used the Defense Production Procurement Act, an outcomes-oriented procurement, government as purchaser uh, strategy since the Korean War. We know how to do that with war. We just have not done that with our social problems. Why? Because with war, every country treats war seriously. Money comes out of thin air during wars, just see how much money came out of Germany recently, 190 billion for the war effort after months of saying there was no money for you know, our kind of societal uh, problems. But the tools, whether it's procurement, whether it's outcomes-oriented budgeting, whether it's the design of public-private partnerships in a symbiotic, not a parasitic way, whether it's the design of intellectual property rights that are not so extractive, because most of our patent system has been used just to extract value, because patents are too why too strong to upstream. We can redesign all the different tools that governments have actually to be outcomes oriented. You know, if you want to reduce the digital divide to zero, reduce knife crime to zero, have a carbon neutral region, uh, so on and so forth, that means you need to use all the different tools that we have towards that outcome. So that's what we work on and we're not interested in becoming a permanent kind of consultant or advisor. And this needs new theory, new research, and new training. It's not just about kind of going in, going out with some sort of big policy idea. What we accuse with Rosie, the consulting industry, is that it's built a massive uh, uh, industry. First of all, with, you know, I mean, this perhaps is, is the strongest critique we made with little expertise in those areas. You know, in Australia, there's a, there's a public organization called CSIRO, CSIRO, I can't even pronounce it, that the government of Australia has actually invested in historically and for some reason didn't use it for its climate strategy. They felt pressured to bring in McKinsey and pay them $6 million to do a climate strategy, which by the way, look up in Google what happened to that climate strategy. It's been accused of being one of the, the dumbest strategies ever, but that's not the point. You know, we all make mistakes. We could have written a really bad climate strategy, but why did the government of Australia think of hiring McKinsey to do its climate strategy and not use its internal expertise or not invest in internal expertise. Similarly, how could the UK government have thought that actually hiring Deloitte to do the test and trace system was such a great idea? Is there any expertise in Deloitte to do test and trace? No. And look again, just Google it, what happened to that system? It was not very successful. Compare that to the vaccine rollout which was very successful in the UK based on a decentralized network of NHS funded GP practices. Again, not perfect. It's not about saying one side is perfect, one side is not, but that's internal capacity, a capacity that also was based on a trusted relationship with citizens at the community level and so on. And so the real call to action is just to say, invest in that internal capacity, not because McKinsey is evil. <laughs> that's not the point. It's not about us versus them. 
ignore them. Uh, but it is about you will never be able to govern the hardest, most complex challenges of our time around health priorities, around climate priorities, around digital challenges by not having that internal expertise which we have stopped investing in. And by the way, I'm from Italy. I get, yeah, we are, I would say we're a, a high income developing country. Sorry for the Italians in the room, but I'm like, anyway, I mean, I, I don't believe in the developed versus developing. I think there's high income, middle income, low income, and some countries have stopped investing within their ability to develop in a proactive way. And Italy for decades has stopped doing so. We have one of the lowest productivity rates in the world, only Zimbabwe and Haiti have actually a lower pro uh, uh, increase in productivity than Italy. But the really interesting thing is that we've stopped investing within our civil service. And every time we have a riforma della pubblica amministrazione, which sounds great because anything sounds good in Italian, but it means <laughs> reform of the public administration, all it's been is cuts. We have cut the number of civil servants. We have cut how much we actually invest in our civil service. And we need to move away from thinking about big state, small state. We need smart, agile, flexible states. And my book, The Mission Economy, talked about how the first thing that NASA did in trying to get to the moon and back, it was a really hard challenge, to the moon and back in a short amount of time, was actually investing in their ability to, tr to redesign all the different tools they had. And surprise, surprise, they actually started with procurement. They realized that the current design of procurement, which was cost plus, was not the way to get to the moon. They needed a fixed price, challenge-oriented procurement with incentives for quality improvement and uh, innovation. They realized that the contracts they had with the business sector weren't working, so they added no excess profits clauses. They realized that they couldn't do it alone. They ultimately had 400,000 people involved in the public sector and the private sector in many different industries, not just aerospace and nutrition, materials, electronics, software. So it was truly intersectoral, interactor, but government had to have the capacity to even know how to design its tools to get all those different actors to work together in such a difficult goal. And why can we only do it with military industrial complex problems? Why do we only do it with war? Why do we only do it with COVID-19 when millions of people are dying and we all of a sudden rediscover the Defense Production Procurement Act? It's a strategic decision we're making to not treat our societal social challenges as urgently and seriously and ambitiously as we treat war. Um, Prime Minister Motley, come on. So, you know, I, I see that you're obviously working with Mariana in order to bolster the kind of capacity of your civil service, but the priorities that you listed are all kind of quite costly. And, you know, in order to kind of meet the, you know, the requirements of the costs of the various things that you listed in your uh, list of ambitions for Barbados, you're going to have to raise money. And so how does, how does that... You know, how, how, how does the mission economy factor in the fact that you know, some of the things that you talk about are, and it can end up being quite costly? You're increasing the kind of extent of the state and the cost of the services that you wish to provide to your people, Prime Minister. Let, let, let me be clear. I also want to just finish up where Mariana left. Barbados' competitive advantage as a developing country, as a small country, post-independence came because of having a higher quality public service than most. Regrettably, we went through a period after 2008 to 2018 where we had the largest exodus of early retirement from public servants, and we therefore lost a whole set of institutional knowledge, and we propelled people to and three levels above where they would normally be comfortable. And that is where the consultancies then started to take precedence over civil servants doing the work that they had done for decades. Our work with Mariana is not to hire a consultant. Our work is to engage a university to provide the training, periodic training in situ to thousands of public servants who we believe can rise again to the occasion to be among the best public servants globally as they were before, mm -hmm. if given the right training and opportunity and systems. As it relates to the question that you just asked with respect to access to money, it's not just access to money, but it's also access to the fiscal state, as I explained. 
Uh, yes, we have an ambitious agenda. And yes, we will continue to urge for reform of the IFIs in terms of what the IFIs and the credit rating agencies agree as debt sustainability. Um, and as to what opportunities there are for us to access professional funding, rather than having to go to the international capital markets where we pay three, four, five times the amount of what we would have to pay otherwise in interest rates. But we are also helping ourselves by looking and thinking outside of the box and trying to see what aspects of that program can be delivered off balance sheet, even if still with the state. So let me give you the example of housing. There is a housing deficit in the country, largely because of what we went through with what I call that lost decade. But we make housing affordable to nurses, police teachers, um, public servants, etc., by ensuring that through the assignment of the roof, the revenue from photovoltaic panels on the roof, that we can take away from them a large percent of the cost of the property. So Barbados has a program called Home Ownership Providing Energy. And it is intended to be able to look at the lower ranks of the police service, the nursing service, the teachers, the public service, people earning effectively after statutory deductions just under 2500 US a month. They will now be able to be de-risked and to be eligible for mortgages that would not otherwise be within their reach by simply assigning the revenue from the roof over a 20-year period thereby allowing the thousands of houses over the next few years without us having to keep it on the balance sheet of government. I give that as just for one example of where we have to think outside the box in order to deliver some of the things that we are delivering. With respect to the hospital, the hospital traditionally would have required a government guarantee for capital purchases. We're now talking to the credit unions and the banks about being able to allow for the access of borrowing to recapitalize the equipment of the hospital without a government guarantee by using the assets that the hospital has and by vesting the property also in the hospital, which quite frankly remain vested in the state. Mm -hmm. so, so there are little things that we can do to help ourselves, but the major movement comes Mariana in taking on the rub off. Because every dollar of debt is not the same. A dollar of debt to build a school is not the same as a dollar of debt to build a power plant, which will start giving you returns within months of being completed. Whereas with a school, you have to wait for that child to mature in order to be able to add value to the society. So that we think that economists perhaps need to work a little harder it being a little more granular in order to ensure that the formulae are a little more fit for purpose rather than causing all persons to be subject to a one size fits all rule. Yeah. Can, can I just add something? Yeah, go, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, one of the really interesting things that we talked about um, also in, in talking to the trade unions, which I was so grateful that we were able to talk to the different social partners, is that if you think about all the different kind of rounds of spending and investment that can happen when you actually have an ambitious program around the blue economy, the green economy, if, if you transform tourism, which of course Barbados and many Caribbean countries are very well known for, to be levers for innovation and investment around greening everything around that kind of tourism industry, including changing what we mean by comfort and life, the good life, which of course when we go places for tourism we're thinking of you know, style, comfort, being relaxed. What does it mean to actually have that within a green economy? That means actually changing the social contract between all the different actors in the system. So the hotel chains, for example, in Barbados and across the Caribbean, but in any country where tourism is so important, can be a force for good or a force for bad. And Barbados currently has a really ambitious program called BEST. I can't remember what it stands for. The B is for Barbados. Sure, surely there's sustainability. <laughs> what does it stand for? We have Luke and Sarah here who are with me. Employment and Sustainability uh, Transformation. 
Okay, so Barbados Employment and Sustainability Transformation, which has uh, um, within it the seeds for an incredibly dynamic and ambitious new social contract. So the hotel chains, in order to actually benefit from this incredibly flourishing uh, 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 demand-driven uh, uh, tourism industry, what should be the right deal between them and the government? What should be the right deal in terms of worker training? If we want green hotels, green materials, green, um, uh, a, a, a green economy, what then is the requirement on the hotels in terms of actually the, both the working conditions, the worker training, but also the materials that are being used for that tourism industry. And really kind of breaking down the word deal in the green deal, right? The word green deal is being used everywhere in the world. The green, as Greta says, listen to the science. The deal is negotiated. It's negotiated between all the different social partners government, business, trade union, civil society organizations. So actually working with, with, with you know, acts and, and legislation like that to truly test the willingness of business to be purpose-oriented, to test the ability of us to think about a stakeholder-driven economy and not one where business is just thinking about shareholder profits and you know, that buybacking uh, a share is just as a symptom of that is incredibly important. And, and you know, the fact that Barbados has that, but hasn't necessarily, for whatever reason, been also implemented in terms of the willingness of businesses and hotels and hotel chains in Barbados to kind of go full steam ahead with that is, is, is where also we need to begin. It's not about pie in the sky. It's about let's test the, the walk, not just the talk, of stakeholder value and purpose-oriented businesses who want to be you know, part of the green economy. So I'm going to open this up to the floor. So prepare your questions because your opportunity to ask them is now. Um, but just one thing that strikes me, you could change the contract between the tourist and the, yeah. and the, and the country, you know, and it might be actually a very really attractive offer to say to people, look, you know, you're part of, yeah. a, of an industry that gives back to Barbados and people might even want to participate in, yeah. in kind of activities in Barbados that would help build the economy <laughs> because, you know, we all want to feel that there's purpose in what if, we do. If I may... Well, that yeah. was one of the oh, things. Sorry, that Mia, we you're did not. You're on mute. Hold on. Speak again. If I may, there we yeah, go. can yes. you hear me? Yes. Yes. If I may, that was one of the things we did in 2018 in the structural adjustment. And we said, look, this country is visited by four times its population every year. And therefore, we need to ensure that our taxation doesn't only come from domestic sources, but that by having a large denominator, we can actually have a smaller incidence. And therefore, we put a small room rate, a small levy on room rate, and we also increase the departure taxes for everyone, not just tourists, but for Barbadians, anybody traveling. So that the combination of those two things meant that we were able to move some of our expenditure off of the consolidated fund and to have a dedicated fund for it. Excellent, thank you. Right, so questions. Who's got a question? We've got lots. I'll start with, with you. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, Juliet Garside one. from The Guardian. I don't know if this is actually switched on. Is it switched on? Can you hear me anyway? Can the people at the back here? Okay. Uh, this is a question for Mia. Um, we've talked a bit in this um, uh, room about the blue economy. How do you um, make the most of that without leading to further damage to the, to the sea and its ecology. What are your thoughts and what's your vision on that? Well, I think it's a combination of things. And, and look, we very much are not one, one is the people. And I had to make this point over and over when we were going through the pandemic. Because if we made decisions solely for the pandemic and no other consideration in the country, they'd be different from when we have to take into account crime, we have to take into account wages, we have to take into account freedoms, etc. So it's the same with the blue economy. We just issued blue bonds last year, became, took a part of our debt, and we issued them as a blue bond at a lower interest rate. And the interest saving, which amounts to about 50 million US dollars over the next 15 years, allows us to undertake a marine conservation plan. Even with that marine conservation plan, the offshore work for natural gas and possibly oil will continue because I inherited blocks that were already awarded. 
And, and when you look at 2050, net zero in 2050, doesn't say zero fossil fuel. It says 20% fossil fuel. And the reality is that even as we try to move completely to a green transition, the capacity of the world is not there. Last night mm -hmm. I spent two hours in a conversation trying to understand how and what are the alternatives to lithium batteries that will allow us to get to a net zero for electricity by 2030, given that our orders for lithium batteries cannot be met in under two years in most instances. The reality is that last year I announced a tax holiday for electric vehicles, we can't get them. So that there is a disconnect between capacity and commitment globally, and regrettably, we are not getting the granularity that will allow for a just industrial strategy to allow us not just to be speaking on a platform, but to be delivering in real terms to our people because the access to both the capital and the commodities are there in order to be able to make the transition. Thank you, Prime Minister. Yeah. Let's take another question uh, in the white jumper at the back there. You. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So I have two questions for whoever wants to answer, either Mariana or Mia. Can we just do one? OK, we, then. Yeah. I will just do one then. Your favorite. Um, <laughs> so basically, my question is regarding all the amount of investment that all your ambitious plans would require um, being Barbados, uh, middle income, small country, and being those investments probably uh, long term oriented. So to ripe those benefits, there would be many years needed. Uh, are you not afraid of, uh, well, of the country being trapped into a middle income trap? So basically not being able to ripe the benefits before the actual payment of the debt has which to is, arrive. Which is something that Mia kind of mentioned. You know, the, I, I what you think what you're implying is the debt burden you know, becomes so big that you, you don't get the benefits. You, you have a huge cost before you get the benefits. I think Mia said something very important before, which is that the debt, you can break it down into whether it's about investment, spending on areas that do create that long-run growth versus ones that are not. And the problem is that many countries that do have high debt to GDP have high de debt to GDP because of what's actually happened to their economies, including, you know, mm. we say with climate, the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action. Nick Stern's big, you know, kind of summary. Uh, in his report, that's just as true with our social problems, right? The cost of imprisoning a young person is much greater than the cost of educating them. So one thing is kind of that difference between the short term and the long term that's really important, which is kind of applied, Im implied in your question. But coming back to my earlier point, you know, Keynes's big contribution in economics was twofold, but he's only remembered for one. <laughs> one was about counter-cyclical spending. Right? We had, for such a long time before World War II, so many countries that would, um, during times of recession, actually stop investing, because times were bad. Right? So business would invest less, consumers would invest less in a recession, and then even government was investing less. And that's why we had, before World War II, literally depressions, not just recessions, just look at the data almost every 10 years. Right? So Keynes was like, stop being stupid. <laughs> you need counter-cyclical government, right? So when everyone else is spending less because times are bad, if government also spends less, you go from a recession to a depression. But his other thing, and I, and I don't think it's talked about enough, and that's why I'm really happy to have George the Poet here in the room, um, and Alvaro Barrington here in the room from the arts community, is both Keynes and Roosevelt brought artists to the table. You know, if, if you think about Roosevelt bringing the artist to the Work, work Progress Administration, why? Because we need to reimagine our future. Like, who's even at the table? Can't just be a bunch of academics, policymakers, and businesses deciding for everyone else. So that's the social partnership issue that Mia talked about, but I would broaden it really to the kind of need for reimagining where do we actually want to go and to make it as a collective effort as possible, both in terms of the generations, get, getting the youth involved, the artists, but also in academia, the humanities. This isn't just about STEM subjects. We need the poets, you know, as much the storytellers. All of this can be super catalytic. It can create a multiplier effect. So Keynes's point was, for every dollar, peso, or whatever of government spending, how much rounds of spending actually are caused in the economy, right? Because that saves you money. 
coming back to your point about the debt, if for every pound or dollar of government spending, that's all that happens, you're going to have to do everything. If by doing it, you do it in a really inspirational, catalytic way that really causes that multiplier effect, the better. Why? Because you're bringing all these other types of finance to the table, not only globally, internationally, through the kind of rethinking the global financial architecture, but also nationally. And that's what this conversation's about. If we keep going back to how much is it going to cost, what's going to happen to your debt to GDP ratio, what's the deficit, the irony is, I come back to Italy, sorry, Italy was forced out of the, after the financial crisis to cut its deficit in order to access European recovery. All the pigs were, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. I can say that because I'm Italian. Goldman Sachs called us the pigs. <laughs> anyway, um, what happened, we reduced our deficit to access global finance, and yet our debt to GDP rose. Surprise, surprise, why? Because the denominator of debt to GDP, right, is That's driven true. by public and private investment. But not just throwing money at problems, ambitious, strategic, public and private investment. So we reduced our deficit, but had a rising debt to GDP ratio. It's just basic math. If the denominator is zero, x over zero is infinity. So even with a mild deficit, your debt to GDP can literally go to infinity. So this whole conversation is about how do we actually inspire, catalyze that multiplier effect, both nationally and globally, and the blue economy, coming back to your question, I mean, the Roof to Reefs program, for example, in Barbados is super inspiring in terms of kind of a people-centered <laughs> uh, 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 focus, which literally goes from the roofs in terms of the housing uh, plan that Mia was talking about before, but then the protection of the coral reefs and kind of almost traces a drop of water from one to the other and looks at the investment plan you need to actually create a green blue economy that has both housing, but also the protection of the biodiversity and the environment in Barbados, but through what? Through a collective investment and innovation program, which doesn't happen on its own, just going to Davos and talking about climate, it happens through that new social contract, literally at the design of that public-private partnership. Um, if, if I may, get another question. If, if, Can I take if, a question if, if, if I may, if I may, if I may. I'm Mia. If I may. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm now known as the other Mia. So just to say <laughs> hi. hi. Hello. Just to let you know, there is a perfume by Ted Baker, and that's called Mia. You ought to get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, what would make your perfect day? <laughs> a perfect day. <laughs> that's a nice question. Hanging uh, out with Mia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's where we both end, <laughs> Mariana and Mia. But, but, but let me say, I just want to add before I answer that, making my perfect day is being able to create the opportunity for Barbadians that will help me to the next level on a sustainable basis. And, and that's what drives every day, honestly. And, and our engagement with the international community to create that policy space and that physical space yeah. that will make the lives of ordinary people better. But I want to pick up on what Mariana said just now and to reinforce it. One, that when I talked about global citizens being artists and sportsmen, it is for that same humanizing reason. Two, that we have to accept that you cannot finance education and healthcare with seven and 10 year money and 15 year money. And that's what we're being asked to do when Britain was allowed to refinance its development after World War I with 100-year money, when Germany was allowed to be able to cap what it paid in debt service on the basis of what its export earnings brought for them. So that you have to have unusual conditions to be able to allow countries to grow. You don't give a baby the same food or, or, or thing, the same drinks that you will give an adult because the baby needs nurturing. A newly independent country needs space in order to put down the institutions that will make a defining difference, and that invariably means bringing people to the fore to build up those institutions. And then thirdly, my other side to let me and remind me, I was trying to be short in my answer, but thanks for bringing up Ruth to Reese, because that is fundamentally what we believe is the transformational program in order for us to be able to adjust and adapt to the new world of a post 1.2 world of climate. Mm. 
Thank you, Prime Minister. We need another question. I think George, I'm going to take two. Please. George. Uh, yeah, George. Where's mm -hmm. George? In the back. Oh, George, right, right out there. Thank Look, you. And I'm going to throw in another question. George, just before you go, we've got a question. Patricia mm -hmm. has a question for Mia. She says, what are your expo expectations for the Macron summit in June? But, George, let's have, have what your question is. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you both for speaking. Very inspirational. Um, basically, the economies of middle and low income countries, as has already been discussed, these economies are often constrained by the dictates of agencies like the WTO, the World Bank, the IMF. What can we do as citizens to apply pressure that transforms the norms around um, investment and development from the perspective of those agencies in particular? Because we can domestically build all the consensus we want, but especially in the cases of middle and low income countries, you will come up against those um, global agencies. Marianne, do you I, I think Mia should answer this, but I just wanted, uh, Mia, this is George the Poet, who I talked to you about, Peabody Award winning podcaster, who is. <laughs> well, sorry, Cassia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I need to get. <laughs> well, Mia, we'll send you a picture I, of George. I talked to you a lot about him, but. but so, can we yeah. wrap in Patricia's question with that? Because obviously it does tie in with the Macron summit. So, but do you want to address George's question? Uh, George, just repeat it again because I got distracted here. Um, I was just asking that because the economies of low and middle income countries are often constrained by what the World Bank says, what the IMF does, what the WTO does, um, how do we as citizens apply pressure that changes the norms of what those agencies require of these countries? So how can citizens get behind your efforts, Mayor? By, 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 by absolutely just adding your voice to the things that we're calling for to give us that more space. That's why we put together the Bridgetown Initiative, but we don't believe that the Bridgetown Initiative is only for governments or policy wonks or academics or whatever. Mm -hmm. We believe that we have to break it down to simple language for ordinary citizens. And that's where people like you, George, come in to be able to show that it matters whether I can borrow money from the World Bank because that extra reduction in the cost of capital may mean that I have an extra $20 million to spend that I can now spend on matters to be able to deal with crime prevention for or to deal with health or to deal with a program in schools. I want competency-based software. Competency-based software for kids costs money. But if I can reduce the cost of capital, I can do those things that would now be out of my reach. So we've got to find a way of showing people that the decisions that happen at the World Bank and the IMF and the WTO have a direct impact mm -hmm. on the kind of world that you are going to live in your community, in your family, in your country. Can I just, can I just pick up, sorry, because Patricia, oh. we've got this audience outside and they have, they, we want them to ask questions as well. And I've got to kind of, so can I just, on, off the back of what you're saying, we've got this summit, the Macron summit in June, which is going to address some of the Bridgetown initiative. You know, do you think you can take some of these things forward and persuade uh, the, the world to begin to kind of address the kind of, make the kind of changes that you want? Mia. Yeah. If I think so? Yes, you, yes. <laughs> I do. If not, I, if not, I won't be spending the time on it. I would be reckless as a prime minister to spend time on something that I don't believe has a chance of success. Do that I believe that I will get everything? Probably not. But I've also learned in life that you claim ground where you can get it and build again and move again. And that's why I call myself a Jimmy Cliff girl. You can get it if you really want, but you must try and try. You'll succeed at last. Look, <laughs> I, I don't believe that those things that do not require a large check, natural disaster clauses do not require a large check from anyone. In the same way that collective action clauses didn't do it when the British and Canadians introduced them in the year 2000. There's no reason for us not to do it because it keeps the lender whole and it creates space for the borrower. In our case, Barbados is the largest issuer of natural disaster bonds with natural disasters globally. Should God forbid we be hit more, not wood, 
There's nobody who's going to give us 19% of GDP to rebuild over two years. That's what the natural disaster clauses that we have will give us. Quite frankly. Secondly, there are ways and countries have already shown how you can deal with the capital adequacy and work and stretch the balance sheets in order to be able to allow more resources to the World Bank and the IDB and the African Development Bank and all of the regional development banks to be able to lend money, to build capacity, to build resilience at a time when the world, particularly the G20 countries who cost 80% of the climate crisis, are not stepping up to the plate with the $100 million promised in 2016, which obviously has a different value in 2023. So if you don't create the opportunities for us to lend at affordable rates, we can't do the things to preclude the level or mitigate the level of disaster that we will face as a result of a climatic event, which can either be the heart attack, the hurricane, the floods, which are the chronic NCDs, mm -hmm. or maybe the flood is the stroke, and the water crisis is the chronic NCD, and the sargassum seaweed is the chronic NCD. So that you have a range of things that we're trying to protect ourselves from. Can I, can I just add something? Um, I mean, first of all, it should be recognized that Mia was one of the, the main forces behind the whole loss and damage win, one of the few wins at COP27 she was just talking about. But just, George, coming back to your question, one of the, the best experiences I had in Barbados during the week, we were there a couple of weeks ago, was in a town hall meeting in, in the St. Lucie uh, Parish, where it, it was kind of funny because we were hiding sort of in a corner. Um, we went from speaking you know, at this kind of high level, kind of government level, talking to businesses, and then at, at this parish, these were people living in St. Lucie, one of the, is, is it one of the poorer, would you say? Uh, kind of boroughs, councils using our speak. No, um, no and it's not poor, it's just rural. Rural. Poorer. Corey says poorer. <laughs> anyway. Uh, anyway, the questions coming to the Prime Minister who was sitting there with these other ministers, who I actually found amazing, just the, the intensity of this town hall meeting. It would be like if, as though in Camden Council we have literally the, uh, the, the Prime Minister and different ministers at the table, was the ability actually to make that connection at the very super local level, the complaints that people were making about the bridge, the street with the potholes, with the way that both the kind of national and global financial architecture was shaped. And it was just extraordinary to hear people actually empowered by having it explained. I don't want to say in a, in a, it was definitely not simplistic, but it was simple. You know, there's something different between simple and simplistic. And one of the reasons I think we have a lot of populist politics globally is that people have been talked down to. They're not part of this incredibly important economic discussion. They fear the economic words. And it was just an honor to hear the Prime Minister of Barbados speak about potholes at the same time that she was talking about the WTO and the IMF. But the other thing, just coming back to that George's... That connection should always be made. Yeah, but George, I mean, I, I'm sort of... Everyone knows you because of your podcast, but George's PhD in our uh, institute, Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, kind of starts with the idea that actually to tackle inequality, um, we have to actually rethink value, right? And so if you think of the trillions of dollars that are made from the hip hop, the rap, black music in general, and how that has been extracted out of the communities that have actually made it, this isn't just about kind of loss and damage, which is reacting. It's also about that proactive need to redesign the institutions so that we're actually reinvesting the value that's created by the communities that you just referenced into the community. Right? So one of the really interesting things that we'll be talking to you about tomorrow, Minister Lane, is what Camden has been doing around the Camden Wealth Fund, right? actually creating like a mini Norwegian wealth fund in Camden, reflecting the value that's created by all the different citizens in Camden and making sure that the companies actually reflect on that and don't just pay business rates that can go into that, but actually put in money in recognition of something that Warren Buffett, who's not a communist, always says. He says, I would never have been made made billions without this massive social infrastructure yeah, around yeah, yeah. me. So what does it mean to turn that away just from being a dinner table talk, you know, reflecting on all this great social stuff around you to actually a concrete tool and institution like a wealth fund, which captures both the wealth creation and the wealth distribution and puts it back into the community that's creating that value. 
And this is George's uh, uh, future PhD here. <laughs> but, but that is about the community, right? So it's both about the community voices at the table, but also putting the governance of these institutions that we have, you know, so that the, the benefits, we're socializing both the risks and the rewards. What the prime minister often says is sharing the bounty, well, sharing the burden and sharing the bounty. Exactly. Actually, we got which time. you haven't said yet tonight, by the way. She always talks about that, which is But well, you did do your, <laughs> she did her move though, didn't she? Yeah, she did the <laughs> fiscal space move. You did the fiscal space move, yeah. We, you know, you the chicken wings. <laughs> uh, oh, listen, we've got it's time for one more question. So one lucky winner. Uh, I'll take you. Just. OK, very, make it very quick, because oh, I do want to get a question in. It's, it's not a question, it's a comment, a further comment on this. Uh, we talk about governments don't have any money. That's the reality. They spend everything and they keep borrowing. I'm on the front line of raising money for the third world, for humanitarian projects and green projects. Now, I'm just an individual. I work on my name and I have over $200 billion worth of projects in my hands. Wow. There must be thousands of people like myself around the world. That's where the money's going to come from. Not people pushing governments. Governments don't have money. That's the reality. Private, there, are, there is a wall, mountain of money, huge waves of money around the world they need tapping into. I have huge projects in Africa, a whole city in Asia, another city in Texas, another one coming up in South Africa, and so on. It never ends, and all this is going to be private. We can't ask the governments anymore. Okay. They don't have well, any Well, that's money. an interesting comment. But let's yeah. just get one last Thank question you. in. I think I'm going to go for you. Another a woman. Person. I think we need oh, yeah, another woman. Okay, a woman at the back there, then. Sorry about that. You've sorry. been over-gendered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I wasn't expecting. Oh. Yeah, sorry. I did. That, was, that came out, you know. Uh, yeah, this is for, for Mariana. Thanks. Um, I'm curious... So give, tell us who you are. Oh, I'm well. Anna. I'm a student at the MPA, so oh, okay. Mariana knows me. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious, based on the book, what is the role of consultants mm. if it's not, uh, it's not what, you're, yeah, what you're arguing? And second of all, what's the actual well, strategy... The question, is there a role for consultants? Or it, yeah, is there a role at all? And if so, what is it? Presuming that we don't want all consultants to go bust. And secondly, what's the actual strategy for trying to implement some of these ideas? Because it's not a mm -hmm. sexy political topic, which any party is going to, you know, put at the forefront of its manifesto, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the strategy? Now, you can it's imagine right. a party criticizing another party for, for, uh, for spending too much on consultants. Yeah, I, I actually would love to bring Rosie into this as well. So maybe we'll just quickly say that in our conclusion, Rosie, you're answering this one. conclusion Come on. of the chapter, we actually address this. And I was going to say, hi, everyone. Rosie should. Yeah. You stand up. Stand okay, up. I'm standing up. Hi, Mia. <laughs> um, so what is the role of consultants? If you buy the book, you'll find out. Um, <laughs> That's not good enough, Rosie. <laughs> um, no, so uh, we discuss this a lot in the book. Obviously, it's been a point of reflection for us as well as people who have worked advising politicians. You know, I've also previously worked for the British Heart Foundation, which does consulting for the NHS in the UK. So this is a third sector organisation. Um, what we look at in the book is the problem with the political economy with this uh, industry and the imperatives that drive it and shape it and how that then affects the advice that it gives and how the, uh, uh, that has uh, resulted in um, a dependence uh, between governments and businesses and the consulting industry, the big consulting companies that ultimately, as it says on the cover, um, infantilizes governments, weakens business and warps our economies. Um, the role of consultants or consulting is that when governments have a challenge or a problem that they need to confront you know this isn't we're not we're not Stalinist we're not calling for uh, the state to do everything or governments to do everything themselves it's rather looking at the economy as a whole and where expertise and knowledge and experience actually comes from and using that using that expertise when it's necessary but in order to utilize that, you also need to have capacity internally. Governments also need to know how to manage contracts, how to work with other organizations, how to use expertise, how to identify what expertise is actually expertise and not just 
you know, fluffy um, reports from companies that are able to low bid on contracts and tenders in the public sector. So, of course, we don't, we don't say that there is no role for advisors. That would be an insane proposition. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. We've, we think that there should be a role for learning and actors across the economy. Um, we challenge the, the assumption that the use of these big firms is um, or should be the default. And, and just on that, so the same guy in NASA who uh, changed the procurement contracts from being cost plus to fixed price with incentives for innovation and quality improvement, his name was Ernest Brackett, 1960s in NASA, he realized that even back then, NASA was starting to outsource too much of its knowledge. And he said, if we continue to do this, we'll get captured by brochuremanship. So they didn't have PowerPoints at the time. They had these sexy brochures. So that's the point. It's not that you don't want to be working with consultants or the private sector. You won't even know how to write the terms of reference. You won't even know who to work with in the private sector. So NASA, as I mentioned, worked with 400,000 people across nutrition, right? They had to eat specific things. Uh, baby formula, uh, sorry, uh, they, the baby formula ended up being one of the spillovers. So nutrition, materials, electronic software, all these different private companies, their ability to even write the contracts with all these different industries was dependent on insourcing knowledge, insourcing that capacity and capabilities. So one of the things we're talking about is this trend to over-consultify, over-outsource, as well as over-privatize, because we look at how the history of consulting has actually been the history of capitalism. Consultants have consulted on privatization, share buybacks, downsizing, today ESG and climate, as though it's all just like the latest trend. The governments that are working with the consultants are increasingly not even capable of writing their contracts with the private sector, let alone with the consultants. So it's this exaggeration, right? So consulting on the side, helping governments do things better while governments are investing within their capability to do is very different from being part of the problem, which is this decimation of those internal capabilities. And when the business model actually depends on that lack of kind of investment because then you don't get the next round of investment, sorry, of, of consulting contracts, right? That's the problem. And also the lack of transparency. I mean, at the end of the book, we call for different reforms to be made, and one is transparency on the contracts. So if you're a consultant who's working both at ESCOM, the you know, state-owned enterprise in South Africa of energy, and the Treasury in South Africa, which is in theory regulating ESCOM, that's a problem. And yet there's no transparent knowledge that you're working with both of them. So there's some kind of like very specific things that we talk about in the conclusion, but the bigger picture is that governments should be capable to work with other organizations, which is very different from saying that they let those organizations run you know, the tasks of government. Look, I'm gonna, this is a bit naughty, you're gonna be annoyed with me. I'm just gonna, put this very brief, uh, Mia, Prime Minister. Um, uh, there's a suggestion, I wanna kind of redress the point that all these people watching online have put all these questions in, and I've been a bit guilty that I haven't asked that many of them. So Diana has a suggestion for you, uh, 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 Prime Minister. She says, why not invite some of your retired and highly qualified civil servants to mentor and train their replacements? Do you have capacity in the kind of elderly, mm. well, not even elderly, you know, the retired civil servants of Barbados who could perhaps bring the expertise back and uh, reinvigorate the civil service? We, we, we've, actually start, we've actually started that already. Um, there are at least quite a, five or six of them who have come back and who have been guiding the government, but that's not enough. And what we've discovered is that we really need to do some in-situ training and that's why we developed the relationship with Mariana and also the Commonwealth Secretariat. And we are trying to do what we can um, in the main service, but also in the protective services. Because quite frankly, just taking the top three or four and sending them overseas to the UK or Singapore or Canada or wherever for training, while good, will not be sufficient for us to make the transition in the requisite time so that the work environment is as much, therefore, a training environment mm. um, as, as it will be anything else. And then secondly, because Barbados was colonized earlier than most other countries in the British, and a lot of systems were put in place, our police services, 1835, our psychiatric hospital, the 1850s, um, 1870s, our post office, the 1850s, 
it means that we have not modified as quickly a lot of the older systems that were intended for a different time, especially with the rate of change increasing as fast as it has in the last 20 to 25 years. So we're spending a lot of time deconstructing and reconstructing and asking some simple questions. What is the public purpose of government or the public mischief that we're trying to avoid? Does technology offer us an opportunity to do differently that which we were doing before? And if so, who are the winners and who are the losers? Who do we empower and enfranchise or who is disenfranchised or left out of the equation when we make the change? And that way we walk by sight and not simply by faith. Mm. Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to tell you that I really am sorry that I'm not there in person. But I'd equally like to tell you that where I am is a lot more pleasant than where you are. Don't worry, Prime Minister, no one's blaming you for staying in Barbados. No one's blaming you. Listen, it's been a fantastic session. I hope you all enjoyed it. We went a bit over time. I hope you'll indulge us all for doing that and think it was worthwhile. Everyone watching online, thank you very much indeed for being with us. I'm sorry we didn't do more of your questions. I did my best, but there were so many oh. questions here as well. Um, don't forget to click the links in the chat for more information for those of you online about the work of our speakers mm -hmm. and the RSA. You will also find links to Mariana's excellent book. And for you, those of you here, you have the good fortune to be able to buy a copy from the author, the two authors mm -hmm. themselves. You've got double, double, you know, both of them <laughs> here to, uh, to be with you. So do stick around for that. Um, finally, a huge thank you to Mariana, to Mia, uh, for what's been a really interesting... Oh, oh, yeah, and the other Mia, and George, and all the rest of you, and Rosie for chipping in there and standing up and uh, explaining the book. So that's a wonderful thank you all for taking part. Mm, thank you, Justin. Uh, thank you, thank you thank very you much Justin. indeed, and good night. Thank you. <laughs>